Well, I'd like your opinion on this. I'm a little, I agree with you, j broadly speaking, I'm a little uncomfortable, <laughs> maybe is the right word, with the Kepler results of the multiple super-Earth systems so tightly packed in, so close. Just in the sense that I'm just shocked at how common they seem to be from the Kepler uh, population. Yes. Uh, that 50 to 60 percent of systems can have multiple super-Earth systems so close into their star. That for me is still quite a surprise and I have a hard time understanding from a formation perspective exactly how that might happen. But that might give me a hint, not that our system is incredibly rare, but that it maybe is not the most common architecture in terms of the mode of the distribution. So, I mean, one of the things you have to bear in mind when you're looking at those Kepler results is that what they really tell you is if there is one small planet in the, in the inner regions of the system, and here we're talking about probably inside the orbit of Mercury compared to our own system, then there's likely to be more in the same plane and also in the inner regions. But so just the fact that there is one super-Earth, say, in the inner regions of that system means it's already very different from the solar system. And so I think it may hint at a slightly different channel for forming planets. And this channel clearly is a very productive one that produces many planetary systems. But I don't think we can say whether it actually represents 60% of all planetary systems. It represents 60% of the planetary systems that Kepler can find. But there are many, I mean, for example, Kepler may not have discovered the solar system, right? It may have but it may not if it was among the target stars, even if it was the right kind of inclination, etc. cetera. Um, so that's also something to bear in mind. Um, so I, I, th I think that the analysis that's been done of the Kepler results is very robust and so on. I have no problem with that. But I think it doesn't necessarily tell you how common the kinds of systems that Kepler has found are compared to the overall range of planetary systems, and in particular compared to our own kind of system that we live in. But it's still heartening in a way that the, there's so many detections in the global sample that they have that even though, as you point out, it's only uh, to 100 or 180 days, depending on how you cut the sample, already the frequency of these small planets is incredibly high. Yes, that's right. You, uh, only out to this tiny fraction of our solar system. And then, of course, as a physicist, you want to immediately fit the distribution function and then integrate it a little bit farther out to, it, it gets awfully close to 100% awfully fast, but it can't obtain uh, uh, infinitely. You have to, to think of different ways in which those distributions might taper off. That's right. So um, a lot of the uncertainty we have currently, for example, about the incidence of planets with radii and installation levels similar to our own um, in, in Kepler data, a lot of the uncertainty comes from how you model the planetary distribution function, whether you uh, try to model it as a histogram, whether you try to assume some kind of function, whether you try to assume some kind of non-parametric model. And that leads to basically the main differences between the different values, which range from about 2 to about 20% for sun-like stars, um, depend on whether you assume that uh, the distribution is relatively constant in log period or not. And different people will tell you a different answer. Um, but it's quite striking. Um, it's, it's, it's an illustration of how dangerous extrapolation is, that just by extrapolating in one, it's not even a decade, it's a factor two, and whether or not you assume that the distribution function is constant across that factor two changes the result by 20% uh, from by uh, an, an order of a magnitude, magnitude yeah. exactly for 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 the actual incident. So it's it's quite scary when you think about it. But so some of the work that we're doing w is inspired a bit by our interaction with cosmologists mm -hmm. who have at least in the last decade and more tended to use more advanced statistical techniques than we would in the exoplanet community. And you were part of organizing a meeting last year that tried to really attack this issue head on of yeah. trying to use the most advanced or at least uh, only 20 years old techniques uh, from the statistics community to think a bit more broadly about how to model these exoplanet distributions. Were you pleased with the outcomes of that meeting and does it give you some optimism for what we might expect in the future? Yes, it was very interesting, actually. So um, we had a number of talks on planet demographics, maybe four or five, and then quite a large number of posters as well. And the, um, there were very different approaches to tackling the problem from what you would call very naive, very traditional uh, approaches, where you just try and account for um, the detection biases and model the population distribution in a very back-of-the-envelope way. Um, to um, people who use very modern statistical methods um, 
And interestingly, there isn't always much dialogue between those two types of people, even when they talk right after each other in a conference <laughs> session. Um, but they, they, the thing that gives me heart is that there were increasingly um, a convergence between the, diff the methods that are being used by people who work on very different kinds of detection techniques. So we had talks by, uh, for example, Beth Biller, who works in direct imaging. We had talks by people who work in microlensing. Um, and in both of these fields, they are detection starved. They have few systems, so they have to model them in a very careful way if they want to infer any useful information about the abundance of the planets they're looking for. Um, and in particular, one of the things that they do is that they take into account the null results, the cases where they haven't detected anything, which they can translate into detection limits. And that, if you combine the detection limits from many systems, even if you have no detections, you still get useful information. Um, and the techniques that they are using actually uh, resemble the most sophisticated approaches to modeling the population of Kepler planets. Um, and so the reason I'm particularly interested in that is that in the next few years, what's going to happen in terms of planet detection that I think is most exciting is that we're going to start to be able to study the same systems with multiple different detection techniques. Um, so in particular, it will be the stars within maybe 30 parsec of the sun. Um, which will be able to be studied with direct imaging, astrometry, radio velocity, and even in some cases, transits. Or the transits find only a small fraction of the planets which are there because of the alignment probability. But so we will have methods that probe the inner regions of these planets and the outer region, uh, the inner regions of the planetary systems and the outer regions, and we'll be able to get a much more complete picture of planetary systems than we were able to before. And I'm particularly excited about that, but in order for that to be interpreted correctly, we need to have some kind of convergence in the methods that we use to interpret the detections and non-detections. Yeah. So that will be, uh, that was encouraging about that meeting. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Another exciting thing that's going to happen in, in the next few years, which I, I personally am very interested in, is that we'll be able to uh, increasingly look for planets around young stars. And so we'll be able to get to the conditions in the planetary systems shortly after they form. Um, and now the thing is, shortly after they form, f to be meaningful and useful means in the first few million years. And we probably won't be able to study that many planetary systems that are quite that young, because there just aren't that many young stars in the vicinity of the solar system. But still, we'll get a much wider range of ages, and then we will know the ages of the system. This is something that um, is problematic for us at the moment. When we find planets around middle-aged stars like the Sun, we know their ages at best with an uncertainty of about 50%. Um, so um, we cannot tie their properties to an evolutionary process with any kind of detail. Um, and if we have stars, for example, in open clusters where we have a very precise idea of their ages, then we can say, OK, well, to get to this stage, it has taken that many million or billion years. Um, and that will provide us with a much sharper check on our models of evolution for planets and planetary systems. Yeah, it, it will be a bit of a challenge to get deep information on the dynamics, say, from the, there, there are open clusters where we have good ages, but those are tend to be farther away systems. So we're not going to at least be able to get great pictures of planetary systems out at the 100 AU scale at open clusters that are 100, 200, 300 parsecs away. The younger systems, uh, it's awfully hard to pin one's hopes too strongly because we, we we have uh, Newton's laws to calibrate masses of things like planets and stars, but we don't have the same kind of fork uh, to stick into a star and determine its age. And so while we have models, it's extremely difficult to hang them on something that is very robust, that you could give an absolute calibration to the schema of ages that we've come So up absolute with. calibration is difficult. Relative calibration is easier. Um, what makes the problem challenging is that generally within, a, say, a star-forming region, if you're interested in particularly young systems, there will be an age spread as well. It'll be it's small, so I'm not so worried yeah. about that. Uh, uh, but you're right. I mean, we can do it in a relative sense. Yes. But I'll never be able to tell you that a group of stars is actually 10 million years plus or minus one with a high degree of confidence compared to it being 20 million years. 
Even that factor of two as an absolute astrophysical constraint on a model you might want to test dynamically will yeah. be very, very difficult. No, that, that is very difficult. Um, um, I, I think that you can get ages to better than 10% um, as you go slightly older. Um, and I also think, so basically to about 10 million years or so within the first 100 million years. But um, you'll still never know. I mean, there's really no way to test it. You know there is no way to test it. It's just it's a true. framework of our stellar evolution code, and you just have to hope for the best that it has some actual astrophysical meaning. But you can't make a measurement that will give you an absolute test of those ages. No, what you can do is you can um, study different probes of the ages and hope that they give you a consistent answer. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that, that's the best hope that we can do.